This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Computers, some laid the foundations for the home micro industry, some rare, some available in abundance. There are the multi-million selling blockbuster machines like the Commodore 64. There are those we hold a personal connection to, like my first, the Amstrad CPC. But then there's what we have today, the stuff of legend. What the Japanese nicknamed the God Computer. Hello cave dwellers, the so-called God Computer. That's a hell of a name, isn't it? it? Even makes the Genesis pale in comparison. The machine we're looking at today is a real eye-opener for me. It was never sold outside of Japan, where it served lucky owners from 1987 through to 1994. And today's example here is the later Pro model, which was released in 89. It's the Sharp X68000, of course, which initially sold for around 3,000 US dollars. And while it served many general purpose functions, it was very much a games machine with over 260 official titles being released for it. A premium price then for a premium gaming experience as you'll see, but what strikes me the most about this system is its similarities with the Amiga range of computers. Its approach to multimedia computing using specialised custom chips developed in-house makes the encounter that I had with it a very familiar one. But to call it the Japanese Amiga would be doing it a disservice, it's all that and a lot more. And today marks the beginning of a series of videos about what's possible with Sharp's final foray into home computers. So should we take a look? Of course we will. Let's find out a little bit more about the Sharp X68000. Let's take a look then. Late 80s and early 90s home electronics certainly had a distinctive look. This machine styling is more akin to a hi-fi than a personal computer. It wouldn't look out of place with a record player on top of it, or a cassette player below, perhaps missing only the orange glow of an old LCD screen. You'd be forgiven for mistaking the two 5 and a quarter inch floppy drives for slot loading CD drives, but they are very satisfying floppy drives indeed with a motorised eject mechanism. A soft eject can also be triggered by software, which feels a little odd. I'm used to these drives being all clunky with manual locking mechanisms, not sleek and power assisted. The Sharp's function is given away though by the front ports running from a bright orange power button all the way through two MSX compatible joystick ports, a headphone jack, volume control, interrupt and a reset button. The interrupt button triggers an NMI or non-maskable interrupt. Typically, this is a signal which saves the state of the system for debugging errors while developing. We have a single speaker housed on the right hand side of the system and that volume knob controls the speaker or headphone volume depending on if you have them plugged in. It's all very nice indeed and you can also see a HD busy light or hard drive busy light there suggesting we can use a hard drive and later on today we'll be doing just that. A keyboard port on the left here rounds off the front panel. Floppies automatically boot up when you turn the machine on, so you can, for example, play games without a keyboard, but you'll come unstuck before long. PS2 style PC keyboards aren't directly compatible with the Sharp, but they can be converted easily to work with the machine. This sexy looking Sharp mouse looks great beside the keyboard. It is of course a bull mouse, but this one's held up well and it's supported both on an operating system with a GUI front end and in games titles such as Lemmings or Populous. While the machine was released only in Japan, it could use an operating system developed by Hudson named Human 68K, and more often than not, that was the commonly used OS. It was very similar to MS-DOS in that it uses English commands. NetBSD and OS9 operating systems are also available. The keyboard then features both Latin and Japanese characters, as well as additional keys such as XF1 to XS5, Opt 1 and 2, and Roll Up and Roll Down, which sounds like it should have electric windows somewhere. It's not unpleasant to use, but doesn't use mechanical switches, so it's really nothing to rave about. But for the era, it does have some very nice ergonomics. There's a gentle curvature to the keys from bottom to top, and a bar to rest your wrists on while typing, which does make prolonged use all the more comfortable.
The overall look then is of course subjective, but to me it's quite beautiful, and it does draw on many influences from the time. Even so, I can't help but think Commodore were at least slightly influenced by this machine when creating their CDTV computer, two years later in 1991. The business end of our shop brings with it a plethora of ways to plug things in. The model is a CZ652C BK, BK indicating that it's black, obviously, as you can see, but it was also available in a GUI model or grey, which looks a bit like a fancy compact to me, here's a picture of it, and I do definitely prefer the black. Let's have a quick run through of the ports then from left to right. We've got an RS232C serial port for the usual things that we like to plug in there, a dial-up modem for example. Audio in and out ports are also present so you can neatly connect up your amplifier without cables hanging out the front headphone port. We've also got an expansion floppy disk drive port for when two built-in floppy drives just aren't enough, or perhaps you want to add a 3.5 inch floppy drive to complement those 5.25 drives. Below this we have a port which is labelled hard disk allowing you to conveniently add an externally housed hard disk or CD drive instead of depending entirely on floppy disks. On earlier models of this computer the SASE standard was used but it was later replaced by SCSI to allow for compatibility with more devices. Some X68000s have a TV tuner which uses the TV control socket but more interestingly you can see the see-through colour socket and that's used with the optional colour image unit. It's used to overlay graphics on live or recorded video, such as a video camera, so it's a type of genlock, and still images of up to 65,536 colours can be overlaid onto video, much like the video toaster on the Commodore Amiga in the same period, and I have mentioned the Amiga a couple of times now because there are similarities in its multimedia capabilities and we'll continue to see that when we look inside. The colour image unit also uses the image import for part of that genlock process. Remote is for an infrared receiver and TV style remote control. And printer, well, you can use your imagination for that one. Four I.O. slots allow for expansion cards to be fitted. On other models you got two slots but this is the Pro model, so we get double that because we're professionals. There's something in one of these slots already and we will see what that is when we take a look inside. The ports tell us an interesting story then with signs of video editing capabilities, room for expanded storage and plenty of options for office productivity like adding a modem and a printer. For the full picture though we need to look inside but first I want to show you a little of what this machine is actually capable of. And to do that, I'm connecting up a SCSI to SD card adapter to the rear hard disk port. This is fully loaded with programs on a 16GB micro SD card as you can see, so we can try just about any program this machine has to offer from its history. And for the video output, we're running from the video output port, which is an analog RGB output, and we're putting that into an OSSC box. This is a modern upscaler which converts the signal to HDMI and it's really useful because it can handle 15 kHz signal rates which the X68000 often uses, but not always, it varies depending on what you're running. And of course the original monitor would have been a multi-sync model capable of handling those signal rates. With everything hooked up then we can power on the machine which is looking quite majestic, if not historically correct with my monitor on top of it, and the message immediately says something along the lines of I cannot boot from disk, please insert the correct disk. Or at least that's what Google Translate tells me it says. Our SD card hard disk is all set up, but the system needs to be told to boot from it. So to do that we pop in a floppy disk labelled master disk, and this contains the human 68k operating system, SCSI drivers and various other drivers and patches to get our setup working. Once we're booted to the floppy, MS-DOS users will feel quite at home. We can see command version 3, very much like command.com in MS-DOS, and echo off, which is an identical command in DOS to suppress output in a batch file. The prompt even shows A, as we're in floppy drive A. If we type DIR, we get the contents of the current directory, all very familiar, and you get the picture. There's even an autoexec batch file and a config.sys file. Executable files though do have an X extension instead of EXE, so there are some subtle differences. 
To get this working then we'll go into the SXSI directory on the floppy. Notice the prompt doesn't update to show the current directory but we are now in here. And then we'll run the boot set command. This installs a bootloader into SRAM which will run on every reboot. And then the switch command is a bit like a PC's BIOS, we can use switch to access all sorts of settings in this screen here. Now I happen to know this machine has been upgraded, it has 6 megabytes of memory. So we'll update that in switch, just knocking that up to 6 meg. And we want to boot from the memory location of the bootloader instead of floppy disk. So we can set that here as well. And with that, we should be good to go. We'll reboot the machine with no floppy disk inserted and... Sure enough, it loads from the SD card in the SCSI port and it boots through to LHES or LH File Extract Selector, which is a nice easy program we can use to navigate around the directories on the SD card and launch programs, programs that look like this. Well, the pictures really do speak for themselves, but we've got big colourful sprites, smooth scrolling, awesome music, which you can hear in the background there, and it all adds up to an arcade quality experience for the period. Compared to the rival powerhouse, the Neo Geo, this has a software range from a much wider variety of software houses, from Lemmings to Final Fight, Street Fighter to F-15 Strike Eagle. There's even a version of A-Train and old arcade classics like Marble Madness. It really does sit in that sweet spot of 8-bit classics and arcade perfect 16-bit conversions. With a sprinkling of home computer masterpieces which take advantage of both the keyboard and the mouse. If I'd had this machine in 1989 or the original 87 model which is pretty much to the same spec, my Nintendo owning friends would have been crying into their Cocoa Pops every morning and I think my Amiga even would have gathered dust for days at a time. It's simply stunning and it leaves me wondering what's behind all of this performance. So let's open up our X68000 and see what made it one of the most powerful home micros of the 16-bit era. Gaining access to the machine isn't too tricky. It's clearly made to be upgraded and worked on, and with the drives, power supply, and expansions removed, we can start by looking at the system board. In terms of build quality, the chassis really is just like a PC of the time. It's nothing to shout about in terms of quality. There are plenty of sharp edges with a plastic front fascia which pops right out. This is not a workstation by Silicon Graphics or Digital Equipment Corporation standards, that's for sure. But on the whole, it's very nice. We've got two main boards in the system which are joined in the middle. On the left is the main system board and on the right it looks like we've got SCSI, peripheral controllers and a sound chip as well as a battery which was replaced recently thankfully because they do love to eat system boards when they leak. The original design was a twin tower style which looked great and so these boards or similar revisions of them would have been upright and next to each other in the tower. Our 1989 Pro version though isn't hugely different to the 87 base model, the major difference being the desktop form factor and the design just being tightened up a little. At the heart of the machine we have the CPU. This is the ever popular 68000 CPU in a 64 pin DIP package produced by Hitachi and it runs at 10 MHz. The 68000 was used in many arcade machines at the time and this machine was aimed at gamers so it does follow that this is based on the same architecture to ease game development which companies like Capcom used it for and in fact based future arcades on. 
Yes, the Capcom CPS-1 system was based on the Sharp X68000. Compare it though to the Amiga 500, which was also released in 1987, with the 68000 CPU at around 7 MHz, and it's nice, but it's clearly not solely responsible for the performance we're seeing over the competition. Scattered around the board there are chips we'd expect to find, such as the Direct Memory Access Controller, to manage access to 1MB of system RAM, again very nice, but the magic comes from the supporting cast of chips with friendly names to help us identify them. And they include… Scotch, which is the system controller. In previous iterations this was called Buddha or Messiah, and religion has given way to alcohol in its naming convention here. Between the display chips, this machine could output at 14, 24 and 31 kilohertz with up to 65,535 colours and with a maximum resolution of 1024 by 1024 Pretty impressive. The final model released supported 1280 by 1024 with 16 million colours. A range of custom chips helped to flex its visual muscles and push them to the monitor and ultimately your eyeballs. And they are VIPS, which is the video controller itself, supported by Cynthia, which is a hardware sprite controller. So this is the powerhouse that's shifting those huge arcade quality sprites around the screen. Up to 128 16 by 16 dot sprites could be defined, and up to 32 sprites could be displayed on one horizontal line. This is impressive stuff, and it could be upgraded to support up to 1024 sprites with add-on cards. I mentioned earlier that Capcom based the CPS-1 arcade boards on this machine, and they upped it to 256 sprites. So an example of that difference can be seen in the game Final Fight, which on the face of it is an arcade perfect port on this machine. You'll never see more than four enemies on screen at once on the X68000, but you get double that on the arcade machine. It's impressive nonetheless though when you consider Sega's flagship console when the X68000 was launched was the Master System. Further chips for the visuals included Vicon, the CRT controller, and Cathy, the video data selector, which worked with dedicated video RAM in the form of 512k for text, 512k for bitmapped graphics, 32k for sprite memory, and 16k of static RAM. Everything about that cluster of custom chips really was designed to try and give the most impressive visuals for the time. Great graphics, of course, should be supported by great audio. And that's exactly what we had here, with a combination of the Yamaha YM2151FM synthesis chip, giving 8 voice stereo sound, and an Oki MSM6258V PCM chip for those sampled sounds. The Yamaha chip was also fitted in arcade machines, starting with Atari's Marble Madness, Williams Pinball Machines, Capcom, Namco and Data East offerings, so the music sounds instantly familiar to gamers of a certain vintage. I'd say those chips really are the stars of the show in this machine. We do of course have a lot more going on, such as the multiple crystals used for everything from CPU to video output timing, as well as peripheral and SCSI controllers, but it's those custom sharp chips which really make this a unique and interesting machine. As we put the machine back together then, you'll also notice some add-ons are present. Firstly, there's this 1MB RAM expansion from 1989, which slots into the corner here. This is a PIO6834 one megabyte add-on, taking the system RAM to two megs, which you'll find the majority of programs will run on. But here we also have a four megabyte RAM expansion, which lives on a board in one of the four I.O. slots, so that gives us even more room to play with the overheads of SCSI drivers, or perform more complex tasks in the GUI-based OS. The power supply unit you'll notice is not original. It looks like there's a Pico PSU wedged in there with a power brick, and that's outputting the required voltages for the machine, which are 5 and 12 volts, but with a reversed polarity, so there'll be an inverter and a resistor in there somewhere to achieve that. The original PSUs do have a reputation for failing, so you'll likely need an alternative solution like this if you're thinking of entering X68000 ownership.
there it is all back together and ready to be enjoyed once more. So let me share with you my first impressions of the machine because this is certainly just our introduction to it and we've got a lot more great videos to come as I'll tell you about now. Impressed? Well I know I am and it really does make you feel like a kid in a sweet shop using this thing. I've only just scratched the surface of what's possible with it and what's to be enjoyed on it. Street Fighter 2 feels like the perfect conversion, better even than the Super Nintendo or the 3DO ports which are highly regarded. We haven't even got round to seeing the professional side of things, there are just too many games to be enjoyed first before we get onto that. So here's what I'll be doing to share more of the X68000 with you. Coming soon there'll be a 3 hour live stream showcasing the system for you. I'll be joined by friends like these guys and be taking both your requests and theirs to see what we should play on the stream just while hanging out and chatting with you. And uh, I want to punish Neil quite badly for his sins. Thanks. All right, chaps, settle down. There's also a possible restoration series as we recently won an auction from a Japanese auction site and it's just a, a job lot of broken X68000. So if we can make something work out of all those, get one or more working systems, that would be great. And I'd like to share that with you on a video. Gary, who very kindly loaned us this system, he'll be on the live stream as well, but he's also just purchased a MIDI card for it. And I, quite fortunately, over there somewhere, have some MIDI devices which are compatible, and some games like Final Fight, for example, natively support MIDI output. So it'll be fun to demonstrate the difference between using the onboard Yamaha and Oki chips and the, um, the MIDI sound as well, just to see what sounds better. I hope you enjoyed getting to know the Sharp X68000 Pro as much as I did, kind of blows my mind to think that in the late 80s and up to the mid 90s in Japan, they were enjoying such an impressive system. All the while, I was completely unaware of it. Maybe it did pop up from time to time in things like Edge magazine or gaming magazines at the time, but I certainly knew nothing about it. And I'm glad I've discovered it. And I'm gonna make the most of it. It's a great system. I hope some of you get to experience it, but if not, I'll be doing my best to share it with you in future videos. And until then, thank you for watching and take care. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting the channel using the links in the description or simply subscribe and come back for more soon.